Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to Bible Believers Community Church, where the name says it all. We believe the Bible. Amen. The Bible is the Word of God. It is perfect. He said he'd preserve it. He did preserve it. All these supposed scholars out there that, that think that it's man's job to preserve it, well, they don't have faith. And, and I've said this before, I'll probably say it a million times before I die. Um, I don't claim to be smarter than the scholars, but I have an advantage over the scholars. Mm -hmm. And that's I have a simple childlike faith. That's right. And when God said he'd preserve his word, I believed him. Yes. And so God's word is preserved right here in this King James Bible. And um, uh, I, I said last Sunday that I'm going to put a, a address to a, a blog up here on the board. And, I, and I, I hope I remember to do that for next Sunday because there's this guy that did some things on numbers with the King James Bible that you can't find in any other Bible that when you start looking at that, you got to say, oh this, ain't, this isn't coincidence. No. That God's putting his check mark on this book. And one of the things that he pointed out, and you know, this guy had to be led by the Holy Spirit because a, a human's brain just doesn't work the way this guy's brain works that he's going in and pulling this stuff out. But he took the first verse of the Bible and the last verse of the Bible. And they both, coincidentally, Genesis 1-1 and Genesis, or Revelation uh, 22 verse 21, they both have the same exact number of letters, same exact. And beyond that, they have the same exact number of consonants and the same exact number of vowels. That stuff doesn't, you, people say, well, that's just a coincidence, okay? First word. Well, then he took the first word and the last word in the Bible. The first word in the Bible is the word in, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then he took the last word of the Bible, which is amen. He took those two words. And he said, how many times will those show up in the King James Bible? 77,777 times. All sevens. All sevens. And, and that's, only and, that's and that's not, and this guy has done that. This guy has done that throughout the King James Bible, and it doesn't work in any other version of the Bible. It's only in the King James yeah. Bible. And here's something that would make most scholars choke. In many cases, that, that numerology doesn't even work in the 1611 because you know the, the King James Bible that's sitting in our lap today is not the 1611. No. If you had the 1611 King James Bible, you couldn't even read it mm -hmm. because English was not a perfected language yet. All the rules had not been developed for English yet. <clears throat> and so if you look at a 1611 King James Bible as an example, the S's look like F's. Yep. And um, words, words, there was no rules for spelling. So within two verses, you may find the same word spelled three different ways, and it's the same word. And so uh, people have this thing about God preserving his word that it must have been preserved from day one to the present day. And that's not how God works. It says he's preserved his word, purified in the furnace of the earth seven times. The purification pro was a process. It wasn't an immediate thing. Right. And so when people who are not King James people get after me, they say, so where was the Bible before 1611 if the King James 1611 is the word of God? Well, that's a mocker's comment because where was the Bible for Adam? That's right. Where was the Bible before Moses? There was no Bible on this earth and yet it still existed. Thy word, O Lord, is settled forever, forever. in heaven. E forever means forward and backward. That's right. If this King James is the word of God, and I believe it is, if it is, that means it existed before God ever said, let there be light. Yep. Because it's forever. It is. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were created by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Amen. So we're, as a pastor, um, you know, there's different forms of preaching. There is uh, inspirational preaching. I pretty much never preach inspirationally. There is um, topical 
preaching. Now I preach topically. Topic because when you take a topical preaching is just like it sounds. You take a topic. I preached a series on baptism. Um, and baptism, uh, the Bible says that there's one baptism. And yet I can show you in the Bible seven different baptisms because God's a God of sevens. <laughs> and I can show you seven different baptisms. And, uh, but there is only one baptism. You say, well, wait a second. You just said you can show me seven different baptisms. I can't, right. but there's one that saves you. Yeah. Amen. And it's not water baptism. It's baptism of the Holy Ghost, which you Amen. get the minute you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Amen. That would be a topical message of a message that goes into, because that uh, series on baptism took either eight or nine weeks, I don't remember which, because each week I was doing, I did an introduction, then each week I did a specific baptism and went in detail on that baptism. So that's a topical message. And then we have what I'm doing mostly, and it's my favorite form of preaching, and it's called expository preaching. Expository means to expose. And so what that is, is when you go through a book and you go through it verse by verse, chapter by chapter, line by line, and you expose everything that that verse has to say. Now, here's a biblical truth, and, and some people have problems when you say this. Uh, one time I was preaching a message and, and uh, there was a lost woman in the, in the uh, meeting and her husband wasn't there but she got convicted from the preaching. And she went and told her husband, she said, this is what this preacher said, and, and we, can, we can know that we can go to heaven. And, and her husband said, you know what, don't get, all, don't get all caught up with that preacher. You can make that Bible say anything you want it to say. And you know what, that's the truth. Yes, it is. But you can also get pure, perfect truth out of this book. And so how do you get that pure, perfect truth? You get it by comparing scripture with scripture. When the Bible says by the mouth of two or more witnesses, let everything be established. And so when you take a church that grabs one obscure verse um, and then makes a doctrine out of that one obscure verse, they're not following the guidelines of the Bible because the Bible tells you there needs to be at least two verses that confirm the doctrine. And so the Mormon church is an example, and, and James, you might know this because you said that you were raised in the Mormon, I think you said you were raised in the Mormon church, but they took a verse that talks about baptism for the dead. There's only one verse in the entire Bible that talks about baptism for the dead. And so now if you go down to Salt Lake City, Utah, yes. well, here it's not going down, it's going up. Where we've been before, it was going down. <laughs> But when you, when you go to Salt Lake City, Utah, there in that temple, they have people who surrogate, they, they stand in, this is why the Mormon church was so interested in genealogies. If you're alive on this earth today, you've probably been baptized in the Mormon church, even though you may not have ever set foot in a Mormon church, because they believe that that's a requirement for heaven, and they take that verse, baptism for the dead, and they say, see, we're supposed to be baptizing for the dead, and that's not what that verse says, and there's no other verse that talks about baptism for the dead, and they built an entire doctrine out of that thing. And that's, that, that's error. That's error. There needs to be, and so what we do is we compare scripture with scripture because I don't want you to believe a cotton-picking thing I say. I'm a human being, and I'm not infallible. This book is infallible. I'm not infallible. And so when we go through this book, we're gonna go through it line by line. We're gonna compare scripture with scripture. And we're gonna try and dig out some deep nuggets that probably in the, in the time that we're living, listen, there was a time when the stuff that I preached was preached throughout the land. Times have changed. Sure. Uh, the devil's active. Yeah. The Lord's coming back soon. Yes. He's coming back far sooner than most people can even think. The, the rapture of the church is imminent. There is so many things going on right now that line up perfectly with end time prophecy. And I know that historically there's been other times when things seem to be lining up with end time prophecy, such as World War II and Hitler killing the Jews. But there was a lot of things that weren't happening yeah. when Hitler was uh, here in the time that we live in, you have total disarray in international leadership. You have riots all over the world. Uh, you have 
confusion all over the world. You have wars that don't even make sense taking place all over the world. You have uh, uh, Satan making a last ditch effort. Um, when I study for a message, oftentimes I do use the internet. Uh, there's some sites that I truly trust that I go into to search different uh, information. And to this week, I found, matter of fact, today, just today alone, I found three different articles on the internet saying uh, proof that Jesus Christ was just a rabbi in the Jewish faith and nothing more than that. Mm -hmm. And so Satan's making this last ditch, ditch effort to throw doubts on who Jesus Christ is. Yeah. Uh, the world is set up for a one world government. Never before in the history of the world has every country been looking for that one world government and never before have the governments together beyond what the people, because see that what the people want doesn't matter. The American people don't want what the American government's doing right now because they're selling out. You know, I'm not a huge Trump fan. I'm not any politician fan. I'm not political. But the one thing that Trump did that, and one of the reasons why they're going after him so ferociously is because he said, I am a nationalist. I believe in the sanctity of the United States of America. And you know who's running the country? Globalists who, who, yep. who want the United States to fall under the guise of a one world government. So never before did you have all of this stuff going on at once. There, there's, there was the pandemic that took place and we've already had a foreshadow, a telling that there's going to be another one. Yeah. Yep. An individual who I won't name, who founded Microsoft, <laughs> was instrumental in creating the one that we had. Yeah. And I'm being careful not to say what it is because they monitor it and they'll kick us off the internet. But he's already made an announcement, another one's coming. Yep. Well, he would know he created the first one. And so he'd know that another one's coming and there's gonna be another one coming after that. Never before in the history of the world has there been so much um, acknowledgement of the UFO phenomenon. There's a reason behind that. Yeah. There's a reason behind that. And that is, uh, listen, some of you can go ahead and say I'm a nutbag and not listen to a word I say, but UFOs are real. There's been too many people with too many diverse backgrounds that have seen them and experienced them to, to, dis, just, to just discount it and say it doesn't exist. But is it what they're telling us that it is? No, it's not. They're demons. They're, it's demonic. It has nothing to do with little green man from Mars or grays from Mars or anything yeah. like that. Yeah. It's satanic. Yeah. And... Um, my, one of my big concerns is there's so many people that have heard the gospel and man, we're halfway into the day, into the message and I haven't even started the message, but um, the Spirit's leading me so I'm gonna keep going. But, right. but uh, um, one of the things that really concerns me, there's been people all over the world that have heard a clear message of the gospel and they rejected it. And they have this idea that if the tribulation comes, they'll do what they need to do in the tribulation to squeak through. Yeah. If the rapture of the church takes place. Yeah. Listen, folks, I'm not even sure that you'll notice the rapture of the church. Right. There's a lot of things. The Bible says when it's talking about eschatology, and that's just a scholar $6 word. You know what scholars do? They make these $6 words yeah. so that you think that they're smarter than you are. And I understand their language. Uh, I am educated, but I got over it. Um, I used to have a boss that used to throw out these big words in meetings, and he used to say, who knows the meaning of that word? My hand would always go up, and he'd, for the first eight or nine times that he did that, he'd call on me, and I'd define the word. He'd say, yep, that's right. And then it switched after about eight or nine times of me defining his big word, and he'd say, who knows the meaning of this word? And I'd throw my hand up and say, who besides Jeff knows the meaning of this word? And so, uh, uh, listen, I, I don't think I'm a brainiac, but I have been educated. I can use those big words. I tend not to because I like to speak in a common man's language. Yes. But eschatology is a scholar word. All it means is the study of end times. That's, it. That's all it means. So usually when I talk about it, I'll say, you know, if you look at the study of end times, instead of throwing out that eschatology nonsense, but, but 
It says, the Bible says in the study of end times that God's going to send a strong delusion that they'll believe a lie. Yes. Well, that lends me to think that the rapture is not going to be as visible as everybody thinks it's going to be. And there could be a lot of things that happen. And I've even warned some people about it. And I'm not saying this is what's going to happen, but it would be a strong delusion if it did happen. And Hollywood, that's right, I said Hollywood, not Hollywood. <laughs> Hollywood, uh, they're in tune with what the world program is, and they're brainwashing people into that world program. And one of the things they're showing is that UFOs are going to come and snatch yeah. people away. That's a possibility, but that may not be it. Yeah. If we look at things that Hollywood did, Hollywood also did this movie called Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Yeah. Yeah. What if, because our body doesn't go into rapture, mm. we're going to get a new body. This nasty thing's staying here. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to get a new body. What if, and I'm not saying this is the case, it's just a what if. What if, when we get raptured out of here, an evil spirit comes into our body the moment our spirit leaves the body and and would that be a strong delusion? Nobody even saw the rapture. Nobody even saw it. And you know what would start happening then? Preachers like me would get up behind the pulpit and say, you know what, I made this big deal about the Bible. It's just a book, y'all. <laughs> That's exactly what and, and they would start changing the truth. And you say, do you think that's going to happen? I don't know what's going to happen. The Bible doesn't give us clear definitions. I can give you some ideas. Could be that they do see everybody disappear and they'll say it's UFOs. You know what the New Age movement teaches? It teaches that we're going to change to a different frequency. And those that aren't ready for the different frequency will just perish. And so maybe our bodies will just fall down dead and everybody say, oh, they weren't ready for the frequency. Who knows what's going to take place? But my fear is this. First of all, if you won't accept Jesus Christ on his terms today, you're not going to do it in the tribulation. Yeah. That's, that's fear number one. Uh, fear number two would be um, that you're not even going to see the stuff taking place. And the only thing you may know is that you don't take the mark of the beast. Well, I have a sneaking suspicion that getting saved in the tribulation is going to be a little bit more than just not taking the mark of the beast. And you say, well, what else is it going to be? You know, God didn't reveal it to this age because this isn't that dispensation. And he will reveal it. When, and you know how he's going to reveal it? The Bible tells us how he's going to reveal it. There's going to be 144,000 Jewish male uh, uh, evangelists that are going to be going all over the world saying, this is the tribulation and this is what you need to do to be saved. That's right. and, the, and the one thing I do know, because the Bible is clear on it, you'll have to endure to the end. That's right. What does that mean? It means that you can't take the mark of the beast. It means that you got to stay faithful to Christ. You have to go to the end. You say, well, what's the end mean? The end means two different things. The end of your life right. or the end of the tribulation. That's, That's And you got to endure to the end. And you know those books, Matthew is a tribulation gospel. Most folks don't even know that. Matthew is a tribulation gospel. In the book of Matthew, Jesus Christ says, uh, he's talking to a group of people. He says, depart from me, you curse into everlasting darkness. And they'll say, uh, Lord, we did many things in your name. And he's going to say, um, when I was hungry, you didn't give me anything to eat. When I was naked, you didn't give me anything to clothe me. When I was sick, you never ministered to me. When I, and they'll say, when did we see you hungry or naked or sick or in prison or athirst? And he said, and his response was, as much as you didn't do it to one of these, you, you, <clears throat> you didn't do it unto me. So the idea that these Christian movies show of the tribulation where this little packet of Christians get together and they have this little empire that they built, that they build walls around, they don't let anybody in and they're, they're hoarding their food, they're going to be cast into outer darkness if that's the way they behave because according to the Bible... If somebody's hungry, you better give them food. Yes. If somebody's thirsty, you better give them something to drink. If somebody gets arrested for not taking the mark of the beast and you know about it and you know who they are, you better go visit them in prison. True. That's Bible, folks. That's by anyway. Why did we go down that path? I don't know. God, God gave it to me to give to you and uh, it's free of charge. Yeah. <laughs> not going to charge you a thing. So we're doing an expository study 
in the book of John. We're in John chapter 12, and we're going to be starting with verse 37. We're in John. Man, there's something tickling the back of my throat. We're in John chapter 12 and verse 37. And the Bible says, uh, um, let's go to verse 36 so we can get a little context here. It says, while ye have light, Jesus talking, believe in the light. Who's the light, folks? Jesus. Mm -hmm. While you have light, believe in the light that ye may uh, be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. Don't you find that peculiar that Jesus, who's not willing that any should perish, he hid himself from the crowd. See, most people think they know who Jesus is and they don't have a clue. They don't have a clue who he is. Verse 37. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him that the saying of Isaiah, the prophet, might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, they could not believe because that Isaiah said again, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted and I should heal them. Verse 41, these things said Isaiah when he saw his glory. Whose glory did he see? Jesus. Yes. And he said, well, wait a second. Jesus wasn't born yet. See, folks, that's the whole thing. Jesus has always been. <laughs> when he saw his glory and spake of him. So uh, now the, if I was to title this um, message, I'd title it, When God Blinds Your Eyes and Hardens Your Heart. When God blinds your eyes and heart, because he will. He'll blind your eyes and he'll harden your heart. You say, well, how does that line up with he's not willing that any should perish? Believe me, they line up. And we went in great length last week to talk about that. So last week we covered a lot of the same material as we did the week before, but last week we went into much more detail. We went much deeper and, and in doing so, we talked quite a bit about Calvinism. And it just seems a coincidence. I, I think that some uh, <clears throat> people who follow us online must think that I'm currently reading a book on Calvinism and that's why it keeps popping up. Nothing could be further from the truth. It's been so long since I've studied Calvinism, but I've studied it so much that I know it like the back of my hand. And uh, so it's not that I'm currently in a, a, a mode of Calvinism. It's just that all the messages that we've been talking about bring up points that John Calvin used to prove his heresy of five-point Calvinism. And so we went into great detail. Uh, so some people would ask, why, why are you spending so much time on Calvinism? Well, it's because this false religion, which specializes in twisting scripture and ignoring their, uh, ignoring some passages and adding to other passages in order to twist those scriptures. The Bible says they rest, W-R-E-S-T, which is the form, the same root from the word wrestle. And so they rest the scripture to their own destruction. And so that's what's going on here. Uh, scripture is making a, or, or um, Calvinism is making a strong comeback in the Christian realm that, in the day that we live in. And Christians need to open their eyes. Right. Christians need to open their eyes. And they use verses like uh, um, uh Verse 39 in our text, therefore they could not believe because that Isaiah said again, he blinded their eyes, etc. But it, it doesn't just say they could not believe. It said, therefore they couldn't believe. So you got to say, okay, wherefore the therefore, and you get the wherefore um, uh, back up in 37 where it says, but though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they right. believed not on yeah. him. Yeah. And so... God revealed himself in such a, a miraculous fashion and they spit in his face. They ignored him. They called him a heretic. They said that he cast out devils through the prince of devils. And God says that really? You want a hard heart? I'll give you a hard heart. Yeah. Yeah. You want blind eyes? I'll give you some blind eyes. So that's how God works. And so that's another one of my fears about the lost world that we see with our loved ones. Um, God only is only to put up with so much of your rejection before he says, you don't want me, 
You want some other God? Here, I'm going to give you every reason not to believe in me and every reason to believe in that false God you want to believe in. That's right. You know, if you go through the Old Testament and, and listen, a great preacher one time said, I didn't come up with this. A great preacher came up with it. I do not consider myself a great preacher. I'm just doing the best I can with what God gave me. Amen. Amen. And so, so uh, a great preacher once said, if you want to know how God deals with nations, look at the Old Testament. If you want to know how he deals with indivi individuals, look at the New Testament. Now, I don't think that's 100% a perfect sediment, but I think it's close. You see a lot more about God dealing with nations and specifically with Israel in the Old Testament. And you know, if you go back and look at some of the things that God was doing to Israel and you open your eyes here in America today, yeah. <laughs> you say, oh my gosh, God's doing to America what he done to Israel back when Israel was rejecting him. And you know another similarity? Listen, history is this great big circle yes, that yes. just repeats itself yeah. over and over and over and over <laughs> again. And the only thing man learns from history is man doesn't learn a doggone thing from history. Yeah. Yep. And so Israel didn't think that they were strayed away from God when they were strayed away from God. They were just being open-minded. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, after all, there should be a place at the table for Baal worshipers. There should, you know, that's what they're saying today. There should be a place at the table for the LGBTQ, TMZ, WQR. I don't think there's an end to the numbers or the letters, folks. It's going to keep growing. And it's going to keep growing. But you know what? You can say it in one little phrase. What they're saying is there should be room at the table for the sexual perverts. Because that's what all of that is. It's pedophiles. It's bestiality. All that's part of that rainbow that you're, you're uh, claiming for LBGQT, whatever. It's just sexual perversion. That's right. And they're should be room at the table if they repent of their sin and come to Christ on Christ's terms. Then there should be room at the table for them. But if they want to come to that table that we're having our communion with God on, and they want to come with pride in their sin, there is no room at the table for them. Amen. So uh, things just keep repeating themselves. So uh, we're in the last times when people are going to turn from the truth to fables. That's what the Bible says is going to happen in the end times. We're going to turn from truth to fables. And we're living in the last times when those who say they are Christians will actually go running greedily after the error yeah. of Balaam. And you say, where do you get that? Jude 11. Jude 11. You can turn back there. Jude is a book right in front of Revelation. And some preachers say revelations, but there's no S on it. Jude verse 11, it's only one chapter, so I guess I could say Jude 1 chapter 11. Mm -hmm. Jude 11 says, Woe unto them. It's talking about the end times. For they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Cori. Now, that names three different people. It names Cain. Who Cain said, I can come to God on my terms and he has to take me the way I am. That's what people are saying today. Yep. Yep. And what did God say to Cain? I'm rejecting your sacrifice. I'll have no respect to you. And he did. And he, did. Yeah. And, uh, he, he put a curse on Cain and, and Cain said, the curse is greater than I can stand. Everybody's going to want to kill me. And God said, I'm going to put a mark on you yep. so that everybody could recognize you. And if somebody kills Cain, they're going to answer to me. So Cain was no good. It named Cain. It named Balaam. Balaam was a prophet. And Balaam had some power with God. But he wanted to hold on to the world. <laughs> and he wanted to hold on to God at the same time. And when Balaam sent to get Balaam to come and curse Israel because he's afraid of Israel. Sorry. Balaam went to God and said, should I go? And God said, do not go with them. Right. And he said, don't go with them. He goes, well, if they come back to you in the morning, you can go with them then. They didn't come back to him in the morning. And you know what he did? He saddled up his ass and went. Yep. And when he tried to put a curse on Israel, God took control of his tongue. And every time he went to spit out a curse, he spit out a blessing. That's it, amen. 
And when he got done with that whole deal, Balak said to him, he said, I want to, to give you honor. I want to bless you more than you could even say, and I have the resources to do it. All you had to do is curse him, and you blessed him all together these three times. And Balak, Balaam says to Balak, he says, you know what? I can't do what God won't allow me to do. That's right. But I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what to do, and God will curse them people himself. Mm -hmm. That was Balaam. And what did Balaam tell him? He said, what you need to do is you need to get your kids to marry up with their kids. And then you need to get your kids to entice their kids to come over to your Baal worship and to start worshiping other gods. And God's going to get jealous and he's going to put a curse on them his own self. Yep. And it happened. What happened? Yep. And it happened. So there's two of them. The third one is Corey. Who's Corey? Well, Corey's a guy that stood up and said to Moses and Aaron, you guys take too much on yourselves. We're all holy. You know, people can come to me every bit as much as they go to you. And if you remember the story, and a lot of people don't because most people don't read the Bible, most people probably never even heard the story. But Moses, the Bible says he was the meekest man on the earth. Yeah. And he wasn't going to go head to head with Corey. And so he got all the people together. He told Corey, get all your folks together and put incense in your censers and come before the Lord. We're going to see who the Lord wants to listen to. That's right. And so they went and they got their censers. All the censers is the, the little, the Catholics still use it to this day. It's a little thing that holds incense and they swing <laughs> it back and forth. And uh, um, so they went and got their censers and they put incense on them. Mm -hmm. And when they came, Moses said, I'll tell you what. If God doesn't do something new that's never been done in this world before, then it's not me that you should follow. And he says, if, if God opens the mouth of the earth and swallows all these people up and then closes his mouth on them, then it's me and not them. And he never got done saying that. And the earth opened up its mouth and they all fell in and boom, the earth slammed its mouth shut. That's so that's Jude verse 11. Yeah. Amen. And it, according to the scripture, we're going to run greedily. The end times Christians are going to run greedily to that nonsense. So what do we see today? We see Christians that say, God has to take me just the way I am. We see Christians today saying, all paths lead to God. They're different paths, but they all lead to God. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, Straight and narrow is the path that leads to righteousness. Yeah, Few there be that find it. Wide is the path that leads to destruction. Many there be that fall in there at. The yeah. There's only one path. There's only one way. Right. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Amen. And so how narrow is that path? That narrow, that path is as narrow as the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. He is the door. And the Catholics say, yeah, but he gave us the key. You can have the key. I got the door. That's it. Amen. Come on. So the absolute best way to find false doctrine is to expose it. And that's what I try to do by comparing scripture with scripture. When, I was, when I've gone after John Calvin and Calvinisms, I've, I've taken you and I've shown you scripture. I've shown you the scripture. I, and listen, I don't just give you my side of the story. I give you what they teach. I give you the verses that they use to teach it. And then I show you the cross references to those verses that prove that their idea, their theology is wrong. And so we left off by talking about the means whereby God hardens the heart of a person or blinds their eyes. We were talking about that. I was in the process of showing that the individual is the one who initiates that action. It's not Calvinism's idea of God predestined the major majority of the world to go to hell and he predestined the very minority group of people are predestined to go to heaven and neither side has a choice in it. Oh, that's nonsense. That's nonsense. What did Jesus say as he looked down the hill down at Jerusalem? He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how oft would I have spread my wings like a hen gathers her chicks under his wings, but ye would not. Yeah. Not that your heart was hardened. Not that you weren't predestined into it. Not that you weren't the elect. I would have done it, but you wouldn't have done it. 
You know the one thing that Calvin has a serious issue with? The whosoever wills. The whosoever wills throughout the Bible because whosoever will certainly slaps predestination in the face. Yeah. You're the one that has the right to make the choice. And it is an election. God casts a vote for you. Satan casts a vote for you. And you get to decide to cast the deciding vote. That's it. You can say, I'm going with God. Or you can be like Adam and Eve and say, God's a liar. I'm going with Satan. Because it wasn't so much the fruit. It was Adam and Eve saying, I don't believe God. Satan said, you're not going to die. I'm not? Well, give me that fruit. God said they'd die. Yeah. What happened to them? They died the second they ate of the fruit. That's right. Amen. Spiritually, their spirit died. They were no longer in the image of God. We are not created in the image of God. We are in the image of Adam, according to the Bible. That's right. Adam was in yeah. the image of God. Yeah. But when Adam fell, he fell out of the image of God. You say, what do you mean, preacher? I've said this over and over again. Yeah. God is a, a triune God. He's a live spirit, a live body, and a live soul. And really, I said that backwards. If you want to look at it from a godly standpoint and how God looks at it, he's a live soul, a live spirit, and a live body because the soul comes first. That's right. And when he created Adam, Adam was a live soul, a live spirit, and a live body. And when Adam ate of that fruit, his spirit died. He wasn't in God's image anymore. He was a dual person and not a, a triune person. Right. You say, well, so when the Christian gets saved, they're back in the image of God? No, because the Bible says when we get saved, our body dies. So when we get saved, we are a live soul, a live spirit, and a dead body. And you say, but we're still walking around breathing and talking and eating and everything that we do in humanity. Paul said, who shall deliver me from this body of this death? That's right. We're getting a new body. This nasty body is staying here on earth. Thank God. Uh, the word of God is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, divided asunder, soul and spirit from bone, from bone and marrow. That's soul and spirit. The, the soul and the spirit away from the physical, the bone and the marrow. So that's called a circumcision according to the Hebrews. And so what happens in that circumcision? God goes in because circumcision is a picture of this. But when we get saved, the second we get saved, God circumcises our soul and our spirit from right. our body. Amen. And Paul says, now when I sin, it's no longer me that does it. It's sin that dwells in this nasty body. Yeah. My soul and my spirit stay clean. But this nasty, and I'm leaving this behind, and that's the great hope, the redemption of our body. Right. Amen, amen, amen. amen. Yes. So they start first by ignoring clear and infallible proofs. You know, the Bible says that it, the Bible says that God gave them infallible proofs. Yeah. You know what infallible means? Not one probability of it. Not there's no chance of error. It's infallible. You know what the new versions of the Bible do? They change infallible to many convincing truths. Yeah. The King James says many infallible proofs. The new Bible says many convincing truths. And I have a serious problem with that because I can convince you of something that ain't real. That's right. Amen. But if it's infallible, there's nothing you can do with it. It's just a true hardcore fact that can't be deviated from. So they start by ignoring these clear and infallible proofs, and God only takes that for so long before he basically takes the approach, you want a hard heart? Here, I'll give you a hard heart. And so we left off with me saying, you want proof? Because I can give you proof of it. Look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 18. Romans 1 verse 18. Romans 1.18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, 
but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. It started off with their heart to begin with. Verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. What's a fool according to the Bible? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Right. Finally, verse 23, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like, made like unto corruptible man, into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. It didn't start with God saying, I'm going to blind you. It started with them. God started off by saying, I made it clear to everybody. I've taken all the invisible things and I made them to where they can be clearly seen. Yeah. So much so that you're without excuse. <laughs> That's something else. But it was man who said, well, wait a second, wait a second. I can do this, I can, I can, you know what? I have a problem with somebody that kneels down at a cross and prays to the cross. That cross is not your intercessor. No, it's not. You shouldn't get a picture of Jesus and pray to that picture of Jesus. That picture isn't even what Jesus looks like. That's a Roman Catholic artist who did the best they could to make Jesus a pretty blonde haired blue eyed boy. Yeah. And Jesus wasn't a blonde haired blue eyed boy. He was an Israeli. His dark eyes were dark and his hair was black. He was a man of color. He was not a European. And his skin was dark. Yeah. His skin was dark. Amen. So we're going to look deeply at this when we get to Romans in our study because we're studying Romans in Sunday school on Sundays at 9.30 we start. And we're going to look at that deeply. We haven't got to it yet, but we will. But these folks were not predestined, predestined to disbelief. They were given a very clear and infallible vision of the invisible things of God. And there's never been a reprobate that was decreed or predestined to be a reprobate. They made choices. Yeah. God gave us a free will to do as we want. The thought does continue with John chapter 12 and verse 40, where it says he hardened their heart that they... Uh, well, it says he's hard in heart that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted and I should heal them. Uh, John Calvin also twisted this scripture to match his theology because it isn't saying what he said it says. And this is another quote from Isaiah. So we can look at what Isaiah, because this is a quote from Isaiah. We can look at what Isaiah actually said and we can see what the apostle John was actually talking about. So turn to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8. We're going to look at exactly what Isaiah said. He's quoting Isaiah. What did Isaiah say? Amen. So Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8, it says, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And whom will go for us? Then said I, who's the I? Isaiah. <laughs> then said I, here am I, send me. And he said, go and tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and be converted and be healed. That's what he's quoting right there. And so, uh, that's what's being quoted in, in verse 40, that right there. So why did God harden the hearts and blind the eyes? Because they soundly rejected him to the point that they were rejecting all the prophets that God was sending to them. You know, here's the sad truth of the matter. Isaiah is one of the longest books. It's not the longest book in the Bible, but it's one of the longer books in the Bible. Isaiah is one of the greatest prophets in the Bible. His heart was broken for the nation of Israel. They referred to him as the weeping prophet. And he never had one single convert because he was at Israel at a time when Israel is a picture of the end times of the church age. <laughs> and here's a man of God preaching the truth and nobody wants to hear him. Nobody wants to follow him. And God says to him, you go ahead and go and talk to him and, and so that you can make their ears fat. And they're not going to hear you. They're not going to. They're not going to see what you have to say. And what you're having to say is coming straight from me. And so they start by closing off their eyes and closing off their ears. 
so why did God harden their hearts and blind their eyes? Because they soundly rejected him to the point that they were rejecting all the prophets that God was sending. And that's what's happening today. Yes. That's exactly what's happening today. People would rather go to a good rock concert. They'd rather go to, um, seriously, and, and you think I'm exaggerating, you can go on the internet and you can see it. Many of these mega churches have hoochie girls up there shaking their hoochie on, the, on this platform. It's disgusting. It's not godly. It's of Satan. And uh, um, then they wonder why, why, why don't these people get it? Well, because their heart's lusting after that nonsense. That's right. They don't want to hear the truth of God. They want to they want to come to God on their terms. I want I want my God in the form of a rock concert. I want my uh, uh, God in the form of scantily dressed women up there singing and dancing. Uh, that's what I want because that's what I want to see and that's what I want to do. Well, God says if that's what you want, here it is. Have it. Yeah. Have it. God clearly had shown Himself to Israel time and time and time again, but they refused. I already flipped off of Isaiah, but I want to go back there. We, look, we read where uh, uh, John was quoting Isaiah chapter six, verses eight through 10, but go up to verses one through seven. <laughs> this is why God made the proclamation that God made. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So how much of the earth has God's glory in it? The whole Marianne. Yeah. The whole bit and caboodle, amen? Verse four. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. You know what his first response was? When he, now this is a prophet of God that was living a clean life and doing things far better than Anybody in his generation, when he saw the Lord, he said, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. Verse 6. Mm -hmm. then, when fl then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard, and then it goes on with verse eight. Also I heard a voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Isaiah, here am I, send me. You know, people, yes, people don't, there's no here am I, send me these days. No. Most preachers don't pray about what to preach. Well, most preachers don't even turn to the Bible for what they preach. Smiling Joel Osteen. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Come they on. start their service and they grab a Bible and they throw it up in the air. We believe this is the word of God. And that, they got this little chant that they do every service. Yep. And they get done talking about how great this Bible is. They get done talking about how it is the guide for life. And then he throws it under the pulpit and he never cracks it again. Yep. <laughs> he never talks about sin ever. He never talks about redemption ever. But at the end of his service, he'll say, say this little prayer with me. Now, we believe if you said that prayer, you'd be born again. And there's nothing in the Bible that says a prayer saves you. That's right. Not a single verse in the Bible says a prayer saves you. That's right. Tell them what it is. What it is? Yes. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. That didn't say confess your sins. It says confess him. Jesus, you are my Lord. Yes. <laughs> Amen. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shall be saved. That is the gospel. So two things have to take place according to the gospel. Something has to happen with your mouth. Something has to happen with your heart. And people twist that thing every which way it can be twisted. The Catholics say that's why you come to confession. You got to confess. 
But it doesn't. It ain't talking about confessing sin. It's no. talking about confessing the Lord. Yeah. And not just that Jesus is God. The Bible says the devils believe and they tremble. Yeah. It's not just saying he's God, but that he's your God. That's it. Amen. Jesus, you yeah. are my God. Make it personal. That's a good way to put it. That's it. Make it personal. Jesus, you are my God. And I know I'm not perfect. Now, you don't have to say none of that stuff. I led somebody to the Lord once, and they, when we got done and we said a prayer, and we got done, they said, could you write down that prayer so I could say it anytime I need to say it? And I said, no, you missed the whole point. <laughs> Ain't got nothing to do with that prayer. Nope. There's nothing magic about that prayer. It has to do with your heart. Yeah. Confess yeah. with the, your mouth that Jesus is your God and believe that he is your God and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. That's what it is. It ain't got nothing to do with the prayer. It ain't got nothing to do with an altar call. You know you can't find an altar call in the Bible. Right. Now, I'm not against altar calls. If that's a means whereby people come and get saved, well, praise God for altar calls. I'm not against them. We have a mourner's bench right here in front of this church in case somebody thinks they need to do business with God. They can come up here and you know, do business. We won't bug them unless, yeah. if you want help, if you want, me, if you want me to show you some Bible, I'm happy to do it, but I'm not gonna presume that just because you come down here, you want me in your face. <laughs> and some people have used this mortar bench, but we live in a time when most people won't. That's just a fact. That's just a fact. So there's a reason why God gets, God's long suffering, he is. God's merciful, he is. God loves, he does. God wants to save all of his creation, he does. Yes. But at the end of the day, he's not endless suffering because he's also just. Yeah. He's also a God of uh, judgment. Yeah. He's also a God of retribution. He is going to set everything right. If you watch crime shows, undoubtedly at one point in time, you saw some crime show where somebody at the end of the show, they said, well, he got away with murder. And no, he didn't. <laughs> yeah. He may have got away with murder in this life, Right. But there will be a reckoning. Be yeah. not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that amen. shall he also reap. Amen, amen and amen. Yeah. So these folks were not predestined. They made choices. It's just that simple. They made choices. God puts us with them for far longer than any human being would put up with them. Yeah. If we had people do us dirt the way people have done God dirt, we would have snuffed them out yep. decades ago. Yeah. He showed more grace, more mercy, more long suffering than any of us would have. If we run all the way back to Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse four, you don't need to turn there. We're gonna, we might turn there, but not just yet. This was written at least 1,500 years before John's gospel, and you're going to find the words. Yet the Lord had not given you a heart to perceive and eyes to see and ears to hear unto this day. Yet the Lord hath not given you a heart to perceive and eyes to see and ears to hear unto this day. That was written around 1460 B.C. Had nothing to do with predestination. Nothing to do with that. It was after he had already given them countless miracles and countless wonders and countless, you know, the Egyptians, they, 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 they came after Israel. God parted the ribs. Could you imagine what that would be like? Because my mind does try and imagine that. I'm watching a million people walk through the heart of the Red Sea, water standing on its side, mama yelling at Johnny, get your hands out of that water and leave that fish alone. Yep. <laughs> it took place. Yeah. And the ground that they crossed on was dry. Yes. And they saw it all. Yep. Yes, and beyond that, all the time they're rebelling against him, he's every day in front of them in a pillar of smoke during the day and a pillar of fire during the night. Yep. They go up against armies that they didn't stand a chance to win and they didn't, in some cases, you know, in one of those battles, God said, just line up like you're gonna go to battle and sit there and watch me. Yeah, yeah, that's what he did, that's what he told them. There was another one of those battles where it said the trees killed more folks than the weapons did. And you know what I think of when I see that? 
When I was a little kid, I loved the show The Wizard of Oz. And there's a scene in The Wizard of Oz where these trees are reaching down trying to grab a hold of them and stuff. And I'm saying, you know, Hollywood repeats some spiritual truth. Yeah. And when I read the trees killed more people than the weapons did, well, there's only one or two things that could happen. Somebody's riding their horse full speed straight into a tree. I mean, that's a possibility, I guess. Or the trees actually, what about Absalom? The Bible says that a tree grabbed him by the hair and picked him up off his mule and the mule passed on, amen? God is amazing. And they witnessed all this stuff. Seen it with their own eyes. Seen it with their own eyes. Yes. They said, you let us out here where there's no water. And God says, go hit that rock a couple of times. And they hit that rock a couple of times and enough water flowed to quench the thirst of over a million people and probably over three million cattle. Yeah. That's a river. It's not a little trickle coming out of a rock. It's a river coming out of that rock. And they seen it. Yeah. And then they said, when Moses went up 40 days, and yeah, that 40 days and 40 nights comes up a lot in your Bible, folks. Yes, but when he goes up 40 days and 40 nights to get the law from God, God says, get you down. The people have corrupted themselves. He wasn't even gone more than a month, a little bit more than a month. And these people, after seeing all that stuff, tells Aaron, make us a God. Because <laughs> we don't know what happened to Moses and we'll serve this God that you make us. It's no different than today. They may not pull off golden earrings and throw them into a fire and make a bowl, but they've created a God of their own liking in their own heart. What a shame. And then people say stuff like, you know, a, a shooting in a school. Where was God when this shooting was taking place? You kicked him out of that school years ago. <laughs> You can't get, so, so when it's convenient for you, you want to know where God is. That's right. And yet when it's not convenient for you, you don't want to deal with God. You want to go live in your sin. We're wicked. We're going to, we're going to look deeper in Deuteronomy chapter um, 29 next week, but we are out of time. Boy, time flies when you're having fun, don't it? It does. It does. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Lord, we do thank you for your word. Lord, I, I'm so grateful that, that you did give us a free will and we can look at these truths and we can follow you to the best of our ability. And Lord, I, I know that in this life, probably the best of our ability is gonna stink. We're gonna be like Isaiah and say, I'm an unclean man with unclean lips. And I dwell in a land of unclean men and unclean lips. When we see your glory, Lord, I think about you passing before Moses and you said, get in that cleft of that rock and I'm going to put my hand over you because if you look straight on at me, you won't live. That's because how glorious you are. And so Lord, I thank you that you are. I thank you that you're long suffering. Lord, I pray if there's anybody who hears this message who have hardened their eye, hearts or blinded their eyes, that you'd continue to show mercy, that you continue to reveal truth to them. God, I pray that they'd swallow their pride and turn to you and recognize that you are God. Lord, help them to see that they're going to bend their knee and they're going to confess you whether they do it in this life or they do it right before they get cast in hell. Yes. Your word says every knee shall bow yes. and every tongue shall confess that you are Lord. And Lord, I take that literally. Satan's going to bow his knee and he's going to bow his head and say, Jesus Christ is Lord before he gets cast into hell. Every one of his minions and his imps and his demons are going to each one by one bow their knee and confess with their tongue that you are God. Lord, I confess it right now. I bow my knee right before you now, Lord, and and though I'm not doing it physically, you know I have done it physically numerous, numerous times. You are my God. And if, you, and if this is a lie, then I'm going to hell because I'm putting all my trust in you. Every card I got, every egg is in that basket. And so Lord, I pray that you'd help others to come to you in these times that we live in. Open the eyes, help us to reach this community. We pray it in Jesus' holy and precious name. 
Amen. Amen.